I have some books under the gospel tent. The Godhead Made Easy it explains the Godhead. It's a great book. I've had five printings of it, and they printed up about 500 and sent them to uh, South Africa to a Trinitarian conference. Somebody said, you ought to feel good. The Trinitarian conference all over Africa has got your Godhead made easy. About one God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I wrote that book because I, I had been invited in Macon, Georgia, to Mercer University to speak on um, four different occasions to speak to the theological class about Pentecostalism. I speak for 35 minutes and answer questions for 30 minutes. And uh, I was invited once, and then the next year, two years later, they invited me back two years again, eight years. They invited me four times in a row. I was the only one that was ever invited. And uh, I was honored, and from that, I decided to write our message, Understanding the Godhead, Understanding Who God Is. Most people don't understand how to talk and explain God. That's right. One man talking to one of our young ministers and saying to him, said, what about Stephen when he was stoned? He looked up and saw God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And his answer was, well, you've got to understand when you're getting hit in the head with rocks, you can see anything. <laughs> you know, that wasn't right. The Bible never said they saw God. It said they saw the glory of God. And he called on God saying the same thing we say, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Well, some of you don't say that. Some of you don't. I don't say nothing. I was in a Bible bookstore one time. And a man said, are you a part of this one that's Jesus only crowd? I said, well, I believe in one God, Jesus name. He said, I don't want you in this bookstore. I said, I'm going to stay here. This is a public place. I can stay here. He said, I'm telling you to get out. I said, I'm not going nowhere. I stood there. And we talked. By that time, the crowd gathered around. And he said, you're an apostate. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. I said, on the day of Pentecost, let me ask you a question. I said, on the day of Pentecost, when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? I would have said what Peter said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of their sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I said, you know what you would have said? He said, what? I said, you would have said nothing. He's already done it. Everything's fine. You wouldn't have said what Peter said. You're the apostate. I'm not. I believe one God, new birth, salvation message. Amen. Praise God. And I do. I was one day in the Macon Mall, and I got ready to walk out of the mall. And uh, there was some Harry Christmas there, and looking at me and saying, do you know who God is? I said, yes, I do. And they said, we got these books that will explain it to you. I said, no, I already know. I won't need your books. So I pushed them aside and kept walking out. Not physically pushed them. I just walked around them, walked outside, and uh, they kept following me out there. And by then, I had a crowd from the mall started gathering around watching these people. Want to know what I was going to do. I said, wait a minute. Let me explain to you what the Bible says about God. And the guy started to walk away. I grabbed him by his robe and pulled him back. I said, no, you started it. You're going to stand here and listen to me right now. I said, I know God who is spirit. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There is one God. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, there's one God who is spirit, who is omnipresent. Jeremiah 23, 24, do not I, the Lord God, I fill all space, heaven and earth. He is everywhere. I said, this is the God I preach. I don't know which one you're talking about. I know the one I'm talking about. This is God. He said, I don't want to hear that. I said, I don't care. You start, I kept telling you to leave me alone. You wouldn't get the message. Sometimes folks don't want to get the message. Like one lady said, when the neighbors come in, saw her husband sitting right there in front of the TV. He's sitting there with all kind of fighting the flame, fighting the fire garments. And he had this thing on his back, and he had a water hose, and had everything on him. She said, what's the matter? She said, well, he was watching Smokey the Bear the other day, and Smokey the Bear said, only you can prevent a forest fire. He's been ready ever since. He got the message. Now, some of you just miss it. You'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so I have a few of these left, and the headquarters out there, I don't think they have any. I've got the only ones of this Godhead here to, tonight. If you want it, there's only about 12 out there. I'd like you to get them so when I leave here, I can tell somebody, you're smart. I want to tell them this. And then I have the gates of hell and the prevailing church. This is all about what I believe today's message for this world is all about, what the church is, the Word and the Spirit. Nothing works like the Word and the Spirit in our church today. Don't have second thoughts about any of that. Don't have second thoughts about any of that. Everybody say amen. amen. And so I only have about 10 or 12 of those. There also have some tapes where I was in several Bible debates where I was defending one God, Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, baptism, and spiritual gifts. And I had about five of those debates. And there was always, the sin of it was I always enjoyed it too much. 
And it was so much fun. I mean, one night the Holy Ghost fell there in an incredible way. On the last night, I went through the entire thing of what we believe. One God, Jesus name, spiritual gifts. At the end of it, all of a sudden the Holy Ghost hit that place. And then a man come to me just a few months after that said, do you know what happened in that debate that night? I said, yeah. I said, I know God moved. He said, you don't understand. When you left, the Church of Christ fired their minister. Said, you can't, you do no better than this. We don't need you. The Church of Christ was dissolved. And we baptized about 60 people in Jesus' name. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And so I know our message is right. This is what this book is about. The gates of hell. The gates of hell have prevailed against everything but the church. They have prevailed against education, entertainment, and everything else. But it has never prevailed against this church. This church is still alive. One God, holy, godly, living in this world. It's great to be a part of this great apostolic church. Everybody clap your hands and shout yes to the Lord. Yes. All right, one more time, if you would stand. Please, tonight, before you get away from this place, buy these books so I don't have to pack them up and ship them back. Please. All right. Everybody say amen. amen. Everybody say, I'm an obedient child of God. <laughs> Boy, that was pitiful. That sounded like an Episcopalian morning service. That was pitiful. God bless the Episcopalians. Everybody loves God in their way. The difference is your concept about God. That's what it's all about. Everybody needs to know who Jesus is. That's our job. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. I enjoyed so much today, uh, Brother uh, Molenpah's lesson. And then I appreciate so much our ministers tonight getting ordained. God bless them. Pray for them always. Pray for the preachers always. I was, years ago, I was preaching for our district superintendent, C.C. C. Wheatley, before he passed away, a great man of God, and I was down at his church preaching. One of the funniest things happened that night when I got through preaching, I had forgot to pay my budget fee. And he walked up and said, I guess you know you're not in the UPC anymore. I said, well, I couldn't tell it, could you, when I was preaching tonight? He said, well, I called and told him to put you in. He said, you know, you've been dropped three times this year. I said, well, you can welcome me as a brand new minister three times this year to this fellowship. He said, I told him from now on, when it's dropped, just put it in and we'll notify you and you can send the money. He said, you're going to have to do better than that. I'm going to try to do better than that. I will try to do better than that. That was a blessing. I'm mean, a miracle, rather, not a blessing to get dropped three times. This time you're preaching to the district superintendent right there and he's reminding me you didn't pay your budget fee. I said, I hope you paid me enough to me to catch up with everything this week. <laughs> Praise God. It's so good to be a part of this great fellowship. I have a lot of humor. I like, Mary Hart does good like a medicine. Some folks, they always got this look on their face. I got saved, but I've been mad about it ever since. <laughs> some of you got that look on your face. You've had it since you got here. You've got that look on your face. I've, some folks think the more serious they look, the more spiritual they are. Come on, that's not even close to right. That's right. You can, well, go, you can go somewhere right into, you can look like, well, I'm intelligent. I'm spiritual. That's not God. You can go into a zoo, and you can see monkeys there looking just as intense just as serious and you walk over and see what they're trying to do they're just picking fleas off each other and twisting them. that's all they're doing it don't matter that come on lighten up your face a little bit it's good to be in the house of God have some humor laugh a little bit feel good about it all right how's my interpreter doing you okay with it okay I would like you to turn with me to the book of Joshua chapter 24 Verse 14, there's a great crowd here tonight. I hope I don't disappoint you. I will do my best to preach to you. I am not worthy to preach such a great audience. There's great preachers here that can turn this place upside down. And I'm not sure, but I'm glad I was in ask. I'm glad I'm here. I hope I don't make a mess tonight. I have made messes before. Somebody today told me a while ago, earlier today, shook my hand. He may be here tonight. Sir, I thank you what you said. He said, you're not a bad preacher. You know it? I said, well, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you so much. I've had folks tell me that a whole lot different than that. <laughs> Amen. But I will do my best tonight. My wife's with me. God bless her. Appreciate her. Yeah. And um, lovely lady. May 21st, last month, 
last month, the month before last, whatever day, this is July, May 21st, we have been married 48 years. I know what you're thinking. Y'all must have got married at 11 years old. No, I was older than that. But um, we've had 48 great years together. Got three kids, six grand boys, no girls. I don't know why we're being punished. I know one thing. I know when they get married, there's a major issue there. I know when my daughter got married, she told me the other day, we just did a ceremony for a young couple in our church. And Anna told me while we were sitting there at the table eating, she said, Dad, you know how much my wedding cost me? I said, well, I'm not sure. She told me the figure. I said, whoa, are you sure? She said, yes. I said, I paid that? She said, yes. I said, was I drunk? She said, no, you were sober. I said, I put that much money? I said, I want it back now, half of it right now. I want some money back right now. Well, it costs a lot. So I got grand boys and two sons, so I haven't had to put out a lot. So you that's got nothing but girls in your family, you just better chalk up some money. I got a young lady in my church. I told her, I said, what I want you to do when you get ready to get married, I want you to elope. When you get back in town, we'll meet you at the Greyhound bus station with a table and all kind of gifts spread out waiting for you. That's what we will do. Praise God. All right. All right. Are we going to be okay tonight? I'm going to get real serious in a little bit. You may not like me as much then as you do now. I don't know if you like me now, and I hope you do. Let me see. I said something about Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Verse 15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Everybody say amen. amen. I want to talk to you tonight on this subject. We live out our concepts. Whatever your concepts about God, church, preachers, and truth is, you're going to live it out. If it's not right, you're going to live it out. Let's all lift our hands and pray. God, bless your word tonight. Bless every heart tonight. Bless every mind. Let's pray out loud, apostolic style. God, help my mind to absorb you. In Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Bless your word. Bless every heart here tonight. Amen. God bless you. Everybody clap your hands and shout Jesus' name. Oh, yes. Praise God. Shatter the doubt tonight. Shatter unbelief tonight. While I'm speaking, somebody can get healed tonight. That's right. You can be healed tonight. Yes, you can. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Everybody here seems to be so sweet and nice. God bless you tonight. All the ministers have been extremely kind to my wife and I and the preacher's wives. Everybody's been so nice to me. And uh, the district board has been very kind and generous. There's always somebody saying, can I do anything for you? And when I tell them what they can do for me, they don't do nothing. <laughs> One of them asked me today, what could I do for you? I said, I need some money. He said, well, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> AT&T called me one day, said, Mr. Davis. I said, yes. He said, I want to do a favor for you. I said, all right. She said, I said, what I want you to do is cut my bill in half. She said, I can't do that. I said, you called and said you want to do something for me. I decide what you want to do. I decide that's what I want you to do. She said, I can't do that. Well, then why are we talking? I don't want you to give me something else going to raise my money problems. I don't want that. I can create my own financial problems. I don't need somebody else to do it for me. But I want to talk to you tonight from this. We live out our concepts. This is so important. Your life is going to be what it is based on your concepts. For example, like this. A concept has a self force and power. Every concept has its own power. It has the power to propel you into God's intentions for your life or to propel you into God's alternatives instead of giving you what he wanted to give you. Your concepts are going to shape you Everything about your life. If your concept is right, you're going to build upon it. And if you build upon the right concept, what you build will be right, true, strong, and solid, durable. 
If your concept be wrong, everything you build will sooner or later start crumbling and crashing around you. So that's why we go to church to hear a preacher talk to us. That's why we read the Bible, the Bible, the book. Everybody say amen. amen. I've seen people have so many troubles with the Bible nowadays. They always, somebody's always looking for some type of new ex exciting twist to something. I don't look, this book right here still to me is so exciting. I don't need something else. I don't have to have a dream or a vision. Amen. I don't have to have that. This book still excites me. Yes, sir. And somebody said, well, I just need to see new ways. You haven't exhausted the old ways yet. What you have to do is lay hands on the sick and they can recover. Do that. When you've exhausted, when everybody you pray for is well, then look for something different. Right now, it hasn't happened yet. Everybody you baptize, if they get the Holy Ghost and turn into a saint, then that's maybe okay, but it hasn't happened yet. We still have not exhausted what's all right in this book. So why would you look for something else? You haven't fulfilled the first contract. Why would you want to do something different right now? Clap your hands and shout yes to the Lord. Your concepts. And let me clear up what Joshua said. Joshua looked at Israel and knew he was about to go. And he said, if it seem evil to you, if, it's, if, it, if, it, if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, then serve the gods of your choice on the other side. We know it's not evil to serve the Lord. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is if you conceive it evil to serve the Lord, you will not serve him. You'll serve your own gods. This is what I'm saying to you tonight. If you think it's evil to go to church, you won't go to church. If you think it's evil to pay tithe, you won't pay tithe. If you think worship is foolish and childish and corny, you'll not be a worshiper of God. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It's how you conceive it. We live out our concepts. When I have concept in my heart, when I conceive in me that I need to be in the house of God, I will go to the house of God. When my concept is I need to give to God, I will give to God. When my concept is everybody needs to be baptized in Jesus' name, I will help people get to church and get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody lives out their concepts. If your concepts are wrong, and what is the chance of having the wrong concept? Very easy. The Bible said in Philippians, let the mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Please understand this. The Bible did not say let the brain that was in Jesus be in you. The word brain is not even in the Bible. It's all about the mind. The mind. Our mind, which is our spirit being. Our mind. Let the mind that was in Christ Jesus, let this mind be in you. Your brain receives everything. Any kind of religious doctrine. Any kind of ideas about God. Ideas about marriage. Same-sex marriage. There's so much information out here. Your brain picks it all up. What's the important thing about your mind? Your mind is what's born again of water and spirit. And your mind, that part of you, looks at your brain and says, that's not right. I don't buy into that. That's gone. And you reject it. When you leave this camp next week back on jobs and everything else, you'll hear all kind of stuff said and all kind of things said. And your brain is going to always be exposed to all kind of doctrines and all kind of ideologies and philosophies. It's that born-again spirit. That's what's born again. Your body's not born again. When you're born again, it's your spirit that's born again. We're made in the image of God, dual image, Genesis 1, 26. We're made in his likeness, in his image, us and our. Us and our, the us and our, us is God. And uh, you're made in the image of God with a spirit, will, intellect, and emotion. You're made in the image of Jesus Christ. Adam was in the figure of him who was to come. You're made like Jesus physically. You are made like God with your spirit. That's why there's only one God. If there was a trinity, you'd be made in the image of a trinity God. There'd be three of you. There's only one of you. That's right. You're not made in the image of a tritheistic deity. You're made in the image of God who is spirit. Will, intellect, and emotion. Will is your decisive powers. Intellect is your reasoning powers. Emotion is your responsive powers. Will, that's when I decide I will, I will not. You, you're like God in that he has the will. Intellect is your reasoning powers. This is right, this is wrong. When you're born again, what's born again is your will, intellect, and your emotion. Your body's the same. The Bible says I will beautify the meek with salvation. When you're beautified with salvation, if your body is what it is, it's what it is. If you're overweight, when you get baptized in Jesus' name, you're coming out of the water overweight. Okay, if you get baptized in Jesus' name, 
and you go down into the water left-handed, you're probably going to come up left-handed as well. It's just the same thing. Your body is not going to be changed until the resurrection. It does not yet, John said, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right now, it's your spirit that's born again. Your will is born again. Your intellect, your reasoning, that's what makes us change. So, And that's why we take the mind of Christ Jesus in us, and our mind is what reaches into all the information that comes into us. That's why your conscience concepts matter everything in all of the world. When you go to church, plug into the ministry and plug into God. That matters so much. And when, jo when Joshua spoke to Israel what he did, it was after that later on that they were taken away. and They went into uh, bap uh, bondage for 70 years. This is so strange. When they came out, when they went into bondage up to that time, they always had a problem with believing in the one true God. It's when they came out of bondage. After 70 years, they had lost everything. They never had idolatry problems after that. It took them forever. Sometimes our concepts take forever to uproot and get out of our way. But it is so important. What happens is if your concept be right, you are going to move into God's intentions for your life. If your concepts be wrong, you are going to move into the alternative. Some people don't live in what God intended for them to live in. Some people today live in God's alternatives to them. That's why the Bible said about uh, Saul, it grieved him that he made Saul king. It wasn't that God made a mistake. It was when he made Saul king, Saul had this concept. If God tells me to do something, that's okay. But if I think I need to do it a little different, I can go do that okay. And when he brought back Agag and all of the animals back with him, he spared the best of what God hated he actually thought that that was better than what God told him to do and after that he was rejected for 40 years of his kingship and the outcome of that was very simple he never lived in the world God wanted him to live in God said I wanted a man after my own heart you're not that man I'm gonna get me somebody else and there was an alternative that came into his life there's some people today they're not living in what God intended for them to have there's people here tonight, you're not where God intended for you to be. Your concepts has got you so off base, it's unreal. And so what we have to wake up sometimes is understand my concepts about God, about church, about all of this other really do matter. The concept has energy in its own, has energy within itself. One day I was on my way to Pensacola to preach a conference there and I stopped in Alabama to spend the night at a hotel my wife and I, we unloaded our luggage upstairs, and the man in charge of the hotel followed me upstairs to see if I needed anything. I said, no, everything's fine. He asked what I was doing in the city. I said, I'm spending the night. I'm driving on down to Pensacola to preach. He said, you're a preacher. I said, yes, I am. I said, where do you go to church? He said, I don't go to church. Why not? He said, I just don't believe in going to church. I said, what about the Bible? He said, I don't believe the Bible. I said, you really don't believe the Bible? He said, no, I don't. I said, why not? He said, because man wrote it. I said, so man wrote it? You don't believe it? He said, that's right. He said, I'm sorry, Reverend. I said, no, it's okay. I appreciate your honesty. I said, you don't believe in George Washington either. Is that correct? He said, yes, I believe in George Washington. I said, did you see him? He said, no, I didn't. I said, how do you know about him? He said, I read about him. I said, you just said if a man wrote it, you don't believe it. I said, you don't believe Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, do you? He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you didn't. You wasn't there when he signed that document. You was not there, so you don't believe that. He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. You just cleared the desk with anything. If a man wrote it, you can't believe it. I said, so therefore you believe nothing. Is this correct? I said, have you ever read anything that man did not write? He said, no. I said, then it's safe to say you're way off base. He said, you know what? I think you got me. I said, yeah, I think I do too. I think you need to read the Bible and go to church and get born again of the water and of the spirit. Praise God. These concepts loose in this world. They're not going to do you any good. I had a man one time several years ago. I was sitting in my office and a man in a new office we built. And he was in there putting in the phones. He was down on the wiring all this up, getting ready to put in the phone system. And he looked up to me and he said, I tell you what. He said, there's two things I can't stand today. I said, what is that? Number one, he said, there's homosexuality going on. He said, I think that's evil, evil, and I think it's a sin. He said, where do you stand with that? Do you stand with Anita Bryan? I said, no, I stand with God on this. He said, well, there's something else about some people I don't like. I said, what is that? He said, these people claim to be talking in tongues. And he stopped. And he looked around me. He said, are you one of those? I said, I'm one of them. Everybody in here. We're, we got you outnumbered, man. Everybody in here does this. 
He said, I don't care. I ain't backing down. I said, I wouldn't either. I said, you know what I would do if I was you? I wouldn't worry about who talked in tongues. I'd worry about how many people in my church has beer in the refrigerator, not if they talk in tongues. I'd worry about more how many of them's drunk on wine and alcohol all the time, drugs. You can count the number of men in your service on Sunday morning by how many cigarette butts on your steps. What I would do is tend to that. Don't worry about anybody talking in tongues. This world gets this concept and they think they're bold and smart about it. You're not. My concept is God is the greatest thing. The only thing that matters is God and this great book. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We need to we need to have an analyzation, analyze our concept sometime. What is my concept about God and church and marriage? What is my concept about a preacher and church? We need to fix things that's broke, broke about us. And so we live in these concepts. Man told me one time, he said, well, I'm an atheist. I said, well, that's just a statement. I mean, what's that got to do with anything? He said, you believe in God? He said, I said, of course I do. He said, I don't believe in God. I said, you just told me that once. What is, what is the significance of you not believing in God? What has made your life so much better by saying I don't believe in God? I can tell you what my life is since I believe in God. I believe I know where creation came from. I know where the sun, the moon, the stars came from. I know about life. I know about peace and joy and righteousness. I know about healing and miracles and the things of God. So I've got something I can attach myself to. I don't have to walk around with a fantasy and a phantom of emptiness and nothingness. I said, if that's your goal in life, go for it. That's not mine. I believe there is one eternal God who has no limits. And so we're going to get our concepts from somewhere. That's why I warn people all the time. The associations you keep. I warn preachers and young preachers. I had a young minister tell me the other day. He said, this is what I believe about this. And we got through telling me. He said, what do you believe about it? I said, it sounded good. He said, do you think it does? I said, it sounds real good. He said, do you believe it? I said, no, it's all error. It's all wrong. Everything you just said is totally wrong. He said, are you a know-it-all? I said, no, I know more than you. I said, that's wrong. What you just said and why you interpreted that scripture is all wrong. I get my concepts from God. If you'll believe about the God, what the Bible tells you, wake up one day and start believing about prayer and worship, what the Bible says. Build your concept on that. Build your concept on how to have apostolic church. Amen. You don't have to have a shirt on backwards. You don't have to come in and have a pulpit stand, a swivel chair, and a cup of coffee and chocolate-covered donuts. That sounds good. That's not how you have Holy Ghost power and Holy Ghost church. Amen. Five dozen chocolate-covered donuts cheers everybody up, but it doesn't bring about a move of God. Amen. I had some young preachers went to a special meeting where everybody went casual, and I love to go casual. I don't like to wear a suit and tie all the time. I said, don't I? he said, do you think it's wrong? I said, I don't think it's wrong. I think the wrong is when you go there and you come back here, you think we're going to have revival because you got a polo shirt on and you got a sport coat on and you really think that's, that's not going to give revival. Revival comes through prayer and through faithfulness and through worshiping God. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Praise God. Clap your hands and shout yes to the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. What does it matter? Because if you're not careful, you're going to wind up in your life never getting into what God intended for you. Saul never experienced what God intended for him. It never happened. He told Israel, said, oh, how oft I would gather you together as a hen doth a brood, but you would not. Your house has left you desolate. They never got where God wanted them. And so God did an option there. He said he came to his own, but his own received him not. But his men received him, gave he them power to become the sons of God. And if you don't want what God's got, somebody else does. I want what God's got. I want to move of the Holy Ghost. I want to see people get healed when I'm preaching. I want somebody to get healed tonight. I'm not preaching healing right now. I'm preaching God. If you've got God, you're going to have healings. That's right. Isaiah 6, in the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. There was no room for flesh. There was no room for doubt. It was filled. We need God to fill this house so much with his presence. There's no room for flesh. It's not who's the best preacher or who's the best singer. It ain't nothing to do with who's the best anything. There's only one God. And what we need to do is fill this place with the presence of God in a miraculous measure. And somebody get healed right where they're sitting. It can happen just like that. Somebody has got to shout amen whether you feel like it or not. Somebody's got to shout hallelujah whether you feel like it or not. It has to happen. Somebody's got to say, I'm on the Lord's 
outside. You, you will live out your concepts. It doesn't matter what they are. You're going to live out your concepts. We all do, husbands and wives. If you live out, if you really think, sir, if you really think that that girl you met on the internet is going to help your life and make life, if you conceive, she's your dream come through. true. You know what you're going to do? You're going to leave your wife and you're going to hook up with that crazy girl. And you're going to wreck everything about you. You said, oh, I would never do that. People live out their concepts. They do it all the time. I see it all the time. Young people leave our church and go and lose their whole concept about God. You will live out your concept. What you want to do is make sure my concepts are right and they're Bible-based. When a man's up preaching, that's your time to tie into the Word of God. And if he crosses, truth, truth, truth gives you the clearest, best perspective that you can get on anything. Amen. What is your perspective on this? If you've put truth on it, that will give you the most accurate perspective you can get. What is my perspective of God? I believe God always was and always will be. I'm overwhelmed with God. I'm not surprised about God. I just sometimes get overwhelmed when I'm sitting by myself thinking about God, how he keeps going back before the garden, back before creation, back before all things, you know, all these things. Way off beyond that, God was back there. Nobody taught him anything. Nobody educated our God. Nobody taught him. Isaiah 40 said nobody taught our God. He never sat down. He never sat down in a classroom and said, someone look at him and said, look up here. Let me explain to you what math is. Nobody ever did that. Our God knows all things. He is all things. He is that one true holy God. Everybody say praise God. praise God. And so your concept of God is going to shape everything about you. Con conceiving God as something other than what he is is dangerous. You always need to take a reassessment of what you believe about God and believe that and it can happen. He believed this when, when, when the serpent spoke to her and said, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like God. She bought into that. She conceived that this voice was telling her the truth. She erred exceedingly. And the outcome of it was she had a revelation that that was way off base. And this is what happens with people. We pick up stuff through the internet. We pick up stuff through other preachers, other materials. We read all kind of things. And I'm not dogmatic about everything. I'm just telling you, you're going to pick up all kind of things. And from that, you're going to pull all what you believe together. And you've got to make sure that it's all in line with the written word of God. Amen. Anybody that ever tells me anything that's different than this book, I just dismiss it. Well, would you like to consider it? No, I don't want to consider it. I'm still sold on this book, and I still think it's right. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. About five years ago on a Sunday night, there was a family in our church transferred in military, and I thought they were solid in God. They were occupying positions in the church teaching, and he walked into church on a Sunday night about five minutes to six. And he said, I need to talk to you. I said, well, you've missed several Sundays. Where you been? He said, well, I've been visiting a church, a friend of mine in Atlanta, Georgia. I said, all right. He said, uh, I've been, I need to talk to you about some things about this church. I said, what about you need to talk to me about? He said, I found out that our Pentecostal church is not right. I said, how'd you find that out? He said, I read a book. A man gave me a book, and I've read this. He said, so I need to sit down and talk to you about it. I said, no, if you want to sit down and talk to me about the Bible, I will talk to you. I don't sit down and talk to you about some book you got from somebody. I won't do that. He said, you owe it to me. No, I don't owe that. Only thing I owe you, sir, is to tell you the truth, and I've told you the truth. The only thing I owe you is to pray for your wife when she's sick and teach your children what's right and provide a good apostolic church. That's what I owe you. I paid my debt. I owe you nothing else. I don't owe you five minutes to let you tell me that somebody said you don't have to be holy anymore. I don't owe you any time for that. I don't owe that because I know be ye holy for the Lord your God is holy. Praise God. What we sometimes miss is holiness is not for us. It's for the aggrandizement of God. It's to please God. Let me tell you why we take a stand against so many things. And it keeps our heart clean. There's nothing any sweeter than a move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, nothing is any sweeter than a move of the Holy Ghost that's unfiltered. Did you know anything that moves to you can be contaminated? If you've got contamination in you, it will flow through you this way. But when you come to church and clean and we're pure, when we're baptized in Jesus' name, his blood takes our sins away. The Holy Ghost keeps us. We're washed. We're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. What could take away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What could make me whole again, free? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. 
The new Zip 7XR3 will not work. The only thing that really works is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And here's what people don't understand. Do you think you're perfect? I don't think I'm perfect, but I strive for perfection. One man said, you sin a little bit every day. I said, no, I don't sin a little bit every day. I said, I think you sin a whole lot every day. You keep bragging about it. You're proud of it. I said, I don't sin a little bit every day. I try not to sin at all. If I do, I make it right. What if you sin and you do something you didn't know you did wrong? What do you do? How do you fix that? Let me tell you this. That's why altar service and worship is so important. Some people don't understand what altar services are all about. And this altar right here in this campground, all across this end to this end, is a river of blood flowing here. The Bible said, John said, if we have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, if we have fellowship, that means I walk in, I sing songs, I raise my hand, I shout hallelujah, I love you, Jesus, I speak His name. If I have fellowship, then His blood starts cleansing me. The moment I walk into church, turn off my phones, turn off all the other junk I got hooked up to, I connect, first of all, to Jesus, and I worship. I sing these songs, and they were singing great a while ago. And you stand in your, I saw young people come down here, stand in this altar, worshiping God. When you start worshiping God at that point at that level when you're down here right there something great starts happening there's the flowing of the blood of Jesus Christ amen that's why that's why every time someone sins we don't take them out and rebaptize them one baptism in Jesus name is ample it brings the flow of the blood of Jesus Christ to your life if we baptize somebody every time they sin some folks would never get out of the baptistry There'd be a constant whirl in there. They'd be with the electric heater rolling around in there. But the fact is, when you worship God in an altar service or in a church service, when you worship God, you say, I don't like worship. Noise gets on my nerves. It, noise doesn't bother God. He made Niagara Falls. He created the thunder and the lightning. Noise doesn't bother God. It bothers the flesh. Over here at Green Bay, I'm sure at Green Bay, they, I asked him how many people come to those football games. He said about 80,000. I'm sure you can hear them when they're shouting about their God and what they believe about the football in the air and someone makes a home run, they shout about it. Amen. They feel good about it. I'm going to tell you right now, I feel good about Jesus. My concept is that God is great. And Eve's concept about Eating the tree will make you a God. She found out when it was all over. Her concept of God was so off base. They got behind a bush, and they actually thought they could hide from God behind a bush. They got the first great revelation. He's bigger than a bush. Amen. Jacob got a revelation about God as well. When he was there, he slept that night, and he woke and said, Angels was ascending and descending, and when he awake, he said, The Lord is in this house, and I knew it not. I knew God was in Papa's farm. At Isaac's house, I knew God was there. But God is everywhere. Jeremiah 23, 24. Do not I, the Lord God, I feel all heaven. I feel heaven and earth. I feel all space. I am everywhere. Psalms 139, David said, if I sin in the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Whither shall I flee from the presence of God? And when you walk into an apostolic church and people start singing, you disconnect from everybody. If you're sitting by someone you can't worship God, don't sit with them anymore. Tell them, I got to leave you. I got to sit somewhere else. If you sit by someone and every time you shout hallelujah, they tell you, don't do that. It hurts my ear. You move somewhere else. You sit by someone that knows how to shout hallelujah. Because in fellowship, that's where the blood of Jesus Christ washes everything away from you. I can't hear you if you're worshiping. I can't hear it tonight. Come on. Magnify God. Yeah. I had, I had a man tell me one time, you know, Jesus understand the Godhead. You don't understand him, Reverend Davis. I said, yes, I do too. I said, Jesus was all man and all God, fully man and fully God. No, he was half man and half God. I said, no, there's no half God and half man anywhere. No, that's not freakish. That's not so. He was entire. He was fully man and he was fully God. Fused as one, not confused as two. When Moses saw that burning bush, that tree of fire, he saw the tree and he saw the fire. The tree was a type of the flesh of Jesus Christ, the fire type of God. And one never became the other. The tree remained the tree and, and, and the fire remained the fire. Fuse is one there. And that's what the Godhead is all about. Jesus was fully man and Jesus was fully God. What indwelt him was God. 
He was the eternal God. He was fully man. What died on the cross is what was born in the manger. If it was not born, it did not die. What died on the cross was not God the Son. What died was what was born in the manger. If he was born, he died. And if he was, God was not born. Galatians 4 and 4 says, In the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. I love quoting these scriptures, and you don't understand. Three years ago when I had a stroke, I could not even get a scripture out. I was so bothered with everything. I'd be standing up trying to preach and try to quote a scripture. Right in the middle of it, half of it was gone. And all of a sudden, three months ago, God touched me. I said, God, heal my brain. All of a sudden, I start quoting scriptures, and right now, I don't have any of this down. They was all coming to me. And I thank you, God. I want to know truth. Truth. Amen. I want to know truth always. I challenge the whole world to one God in Jesus' name. I challenge everybody to one God. Salvation is not join a church, get a New Testament, get a bumper sticker. That's not what it is. Salvation is death, burial, and resurrection. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Yes! Yes! Somebody shout with me right now. What are you waiting on? Amen. Eve's concept was the voice I hear right now is just as good as the voice Adam told me about. God never told Eve not to eat of the tree. He told Adam and Adam told her. Here's what's going on in our world. God tells the preacher and the preacher tells the church and the church tells the world. That's the line of the flow of truth. The church is not to tell the preacher what to believe. This book tells us what to believe. That's why when God brought all these, oh, my mind is working a little bit right now. That when all the, they said, he said, I'm going to bring all these animals before you. You name them whatever you want to name them. You name the elephant, you name him, whatever you want to name them. That's what I'm going to be calling. He said, when it comes to me now, don't give me a name. I've already got a name. I've already got a name. My name is Almighty. I am the Lord God. Don't rename me for anybody. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation, but there's none of the name given among men whereby we must be saved. Yeah. All right, I'm not going to preach by myself tonight. Philippians 2 and 9, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess of things in heaven, of things in the earth, of things under the earth. It's a miracle that I can quote all this right now. Amen. You just don't know what it's like. You just don't know. Just set, go through two years of your life. You can't even recall a scripture. And then all of a sudden overnight, one day you get up and you just start quoting all that stuff, talking to yourself. Because from this book is where I get my concepts. You get your concept from this book. When your preacher teaches something and it crosses what Aunt Lucy said. And it crosses what your Uncle Jake said. Then that's okay. It's okay. You ain't got to worry about that. Go with what the book says. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. I was in a Bible discussion getting ready to get in one. I was signing some papers. And they sent me, said, salvation is at the point the penitent sinner repents, he is then saved. And they sent me one saying, this is what salvation the United Pentecostal Church believes. I said, no, that's not what I believe. That's not what we believe. I said, and he said, I've debated some of your brethren. That's what they said. I said, well, you're not debating them now. You're debating me. And that's not what I'm going to sign. I tell you what I will discuss with you with this. I will, I will do this. Salvation is by grace through faith. Through faith, by grace, that is demonstrated by grace through faith, that is demonstrated by repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I said, I'm going to write that out and sign it and send it right back to you. He said, I'm not going to debate that. I said, why not? He said, that sounds too much like Scripture. <laughs> That's exactly what I believe is what this book says. And if you've got your doubts, come on, pray back through. Go back through the study course. Do something. Don't you have second thoughts about it. Your concept. Everybody lives out their concepts. We all live out our concept. That's why we have to constantly have the word of God as a steady diet for us.
Balaam believed. He actually believed when God told him not to go curse Israel, he developed this idea that I think I can circumvent what God says. Let me get back to Saul. Saul lost so much. This is what happened to Saul. When he come back and he brought Agag with him and all those animals, to, he said, I want to offer these to God. And, and, uh, and uh, Samuel said, do you think God delights that much in a sacrifice? Obedience is better than sacrifice. He wants you to obey his word. And this concept that how, if I want to sacrifice this to God, that's good enough. No, it's not good enough. You have spared the best of what God hated. And that's wrong. Don't do that. Amen. And this is, what, this is how bad this man's concept was. He said this. He said, he said, oh, brother. He said this. He said, Samuel, and by that time, Samuel ripped his garments and said, you're no longer king. God has just taken the throne from you, the kingdom of Israel from you, and he's going to give it to another man more humble than you. God's intention was you. You was head and shoulders above everybody. God intended to make you higher than anything else. But you decided, no, my ideas are better than God. My concepts are better. And he said, it's not going to work. So this is what he said to Samuel. He said, walk with me before the people and let's do sacrifice so they'll think I love God. And this is where this man's concept of life was. If I walk with some people, I'll look spiritual. You walk with me where the Israel will see me make me look spiritual. I don't want to just look spiritual. I want to be spiritual. I don't want to look right. I want to be right. I don't want to just look like I believe the truth. I want to believe this truth. I don't want to look like a child of God only. I want to be a child of God. I want to look like it and be a child of God. I want to worship God in spirit and in truth. I don't want somebody to put me up. I want to come in on fire. I feel like preaching my heart out tonight. I have not felt this kind of anointing on me in over three years. I feel like pouring out my soul right now. Come on now. Somebody get shot happy tonight. Get shot happy tonight. In Jesus' name. Yes, in Jesus. Everybody clap your hands and shout yes to the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Ma'am, your concept, sir, to the preachers here, to preachers' wives, don't ever get these crazy concepts. Holiness doesn't matter. Holiness matters. Never get these things that their uh, worship doesn't matter. It does matter. Yes, it does. I don't think you got to shout every time you come to church. Nobody said you do. You always got to worship God. The Bible said he inhabits the praises of his people. If you want God in your church, praise him. That's where he's comfortable. He enjoys walking in and sitting down where someone says praising God. He's happy when you praise him. Amen. I need somebody to say amen one more time. Amen. If you're not careful, your concept can cause you to miss the things of God. That's right. Did you know that you can get in this position? Your concepts will propel you to great victory, great joy. And it can propel you into a world where you don't want to be. It's an alternative. This is not what God intended. That's what he said to Saul. This is not what I intended for you. It grieved him. It grieved him. First Samuel, it grieved him that he made Saul king. It did not mean that God made a mistake. When he said in Genesis, it grieved him that he made man. It didn't mean that God made a mistake. He was saying, this is not what I intended for you to be. It's like this. Let me put it to you this way. It's like a grandfather. He buys a real pretty red wagon. He puts his grandbaby in there and he pulls him around the yard and all of a sudden the wagon tilts over and the kid hits his head and 17 stitches goes in there. He regrets that wagon. He regrets doing that. But it doesn't just, it wasn't a mistake. What he's really saying is, I got this wagon. I didn't intend for this to happen. God's just saying to Saul, I did not intend for you to do this. He looked at mankind. I did not intend for you to worship gods and idols. I intended for you to be my glory and my honor. And so if you're not careful, you'll let your concept take you so far from God. There will be no restoration for you. You can't fix it. So that was not what, you know, when Jonah got ready to go preach, he told God, he later said, did not I tell thee in my country that as soon as I got over there and preached to these Assyrians, 
Nineveh, that you was going to have a change of heart. You was a, uh, a slow of anger, a merciful God. Did not I tell you this? And you told me to go anyway. I didn't want to go. And he said, I didn't go. What was the alternative? He took a belly ride in the well. Right. Right. Amen. Right. And when well got over there and vomited him, him up. I don't know how you do that. In... <laughs> okay, there you go. Good job. That's right. That's right. Then he went to preach. And there was a great revival. Let me tell you something. If God had not shaken him up, there would have been a great move. There would be no great move of God. It would not have happened. Sometimes our concepts take us away from what God has intended for us to have and enjoy. Sometimes I see a young girl date a guy, and I know the guy's not for her. This guy's not for you. You can do better than that. That guy's not for you. Oh, yes, he's my only one. He loves me. No, he don't love you. He don't know you. And you don't love him. Yes, I'm wild about him. No, you're probably wild, but you're not right. You don't know him. He loves me. What this young lady said one time, she walked into the preacher and said, um, uh, I want to talk to you about marriage. He said, well, you know, there's one woman for one man, one man for one woman. That's God's program. You can't improve on it. She said, I'm not trying to improve on it. I just want to get in on it. My jokes tonight keep going over y'all's head. I don't know where y'all come from. Are y'all waterlogged? The fact is that sometimes a young girl will have a concept. This guy, I've got to have this guy. No, you really don't. I was on the plane flying one time, and a young lady sat next to me, a beautiful young girl, about 16 years old. I said, where are you going? She said, oh, she was going somewhere in South America. I said, for what? She said, to get married. I said, who are you marrying? She said, a guy I met on the Internet. I said, I can't believe, I, is this for real? I said, when this plane lands, you get your ticket and go right back home. I said, I'm a minister, I'm telling you. She said, but he said he loves me. Have you sent him a picture? She said, yes, I'm sure he would love you. You're a beautiful girl. But uh, that's all, he, he's not for you, girl. What does your mom and dad say? She said, they're all upset at me about it. Then land and get a ticket and get back. You don't need to go waste your life with this. We get a concept and we'll carry it out. We'll sneak around and we'll meet them. We'll talk with them somewhere. And the guys do it with girls. And we don't need to, you don't need to say we, I don't do it. You, you know, I'm way past that now. I just flirt with one girl over here. <laughs> Amen. I have to try to still work and train her. She was asking me to do something one day. And I said, I don't know. She said, I know. I know when I asked you to fix this cabinet, you wasn't going to do it. I said, well, see, that's your make, the mistake you made. See, I, I am like God. I don't operate on unbelief. If you would have said, fix this cabinet, I do believe I would have been able to fix that cabinet. But I don't operate on unbelief. You've got to be able to say, I believe, and then you get me to do something. Everybody, now I don't went over your head again. Some of you need to stand on the pews. You're not getting it. You're missing everything. Naaman. Naaman almost missed a healing and a miracle in his life. Yes, he did. His concept was so messed up. When, they, when the young girl said, I would to God he knew the king in my country, his servant. And my Lord, if he knew the king in our country, there's a man of God there that could heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman goofed up three areas. He got there. When he got there, the man of God did not come out, but he sent out Gehazi to greet him and tell him something. First of all, this man had this concept about a preacher. A preacher should do the way I want him to do. A preacher should preach the way I want him to preach. That was a bad concept. He said, I want this man to, uh, I, th I thought he would come out, wave his hand over me and do something, cause it to happen. No. That was wrong. He said, go to the river of Jordan and wash, dip seven times and wash seven times. He didn't like the message. He said, there's better rivers than Jordan. He didn't like the method of the man of God. He didn't like the message of the man of God. And so when he finally went over there and washed and he come out clean and pure, he went home. First of all, he almost missed his miracle. And they said, if it had told you to do a great thing, would you have done it? Of course you would have. He asked you to do but a small thing. Why not honor what he says? Let me tell you something. Take the bounds off of preachers. Let them preach what they need to preach. And so, oh, he should have said it like this. He went too long. He could have done this. Come on. Don't do that. Sometimes we need to take the limits off of a man of God and let him tell us what God has to say for us. Anything you can say to help me get to heaven, I want to hear it. If you can help me have faith for healing, I want to hear it. Praise God. Praise God. And I know how God can talk to you if you want to. I listen to God. When they was getting me ready for my triple bypass heart surgery, 
there was a Franciscan priest that was preparing my body for the surgery in South Texas, Harlingen, Texas, where I'd had my heart attack. And he said, what is your profession? I said, I am a minister of the gospel. I'm a preacher, pastor. This man had such a respect for ministry, being a Catholic, for bishops and priests. He patted me on the shoulder and said, oh, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. He said, the Lord's going to be with you. You're going to come through this good. You're going to come out on the other side of this. You're going to have a great ministry. I'm listening to all of this. It was the same words Paul Mooney talked to me about about four days before. They said, Brother Davis, this is not the end. You're going to come through this strong. He said, I'm going to ride the river with you on this one, and I'm going to be in touch with you all the way and help you with it. When you get out on the other side, God's going to give a great ministry to you. You're going to do a great thing for him yet. And this priest was saying the same thing. Do you, knew the, do you, need, do you believe the priest was of God? I believe what he was saying was of God because God had confirmed already through a man of God and when this happened I would just said thank God for that I went into that thing believing that on the other side I would have a slow process but I would get through it and I kept praying and pushing myself over and over and over tonight I feel an unusual anointing on me right now I'm saying to this Wisconsin district this is your day to get fresh concept true right to the word of God Jesus name if you was doubting Jesus name don't ever doubt the power of Jesus name again if you're doubting one God don't ever do that again if you're doubting the power of the Bible Tenny sings here don't let your preacher doubt the power of this Bible you tell him preach the word to me preach the word to me preach the word to me preach this book to me clap your hands and shout yes Praise God. Anybody know what time I started? Y'all know what time I started? What? I don't want to go too long tonight. But I do want to leave something with you from my heart. This whole afternoon at the hotel I'm staying at, they got a big room down away from where I'm at. And I was in there every day. Last night, lady in there praying. I was there again this morning. A while ago, went in there praying. A lady came in there and said, sir, you okay? I said, I'm fine, ma'am. I'm just, I got to preach tonight, so I'm trying to reflect my thoughts and pray, keep my mind on God. She said, do you need some light? I said, no, I'm fine right here. I'm fine. So I just kept praying for God to help me. I felt, I wrestled all day about what to preach to you tonight. And this is what... Five o'clock this evening, come to you. Tell these people that they live out their concept. Everybody lives out their concept. If your concept about a preacher is, I got to tell him what to do, your concept is way off. If you got that habit, don't ever do that. Don't you ever do that. You said, it's always been my habit. Change your habit. Change it right now. You're wrong in that. He said, I thought you would come out and wave your hand over me. Your methods. I don't like your method. And then he said, I don't like your message. There's better rivers right here in Syria than this one. That's all right. God's word. Like, come on. I know what people are saying. There's a better name than Jesus. No, there's not. There's no other name. That's the only saving name. No better name than Jesus. Come on. The best salvation is death, burial, and resurrection. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name. Praise God. Clap your hands and shout yes to the Lord. And when he left and got back, the leprosy was all gone. He wanted one more thing from this preacher, which was wrong. He said, now, when I go back to Syria, my king leans on me. He puts his hand on my shoulder. He's old and not healthy. And he goes into his temple to worship his God. And so when I go into his temple with him, and he kneels before his God, and I kneel there with him, pardon me, my Lord, in this manner. Please pardon me when I do this. This is why in the New Testament, they've done a lot of glory to this, this man. Leprosy was one of the few things that ever got healed in the Bible. And this man did not get the glory he should not, he should have gotten. He almost lost it all. When he asked him, said, you can't ask a man of God to do this. When you see me do wrong, please turn your head. You don't want your preacher to turn your head, his head when he sees you do wrong. You want him to talk to you about that. You want to be saved. I don't want to re reiterate what I said last night. I think I covered it probably fairly good. And so I think you ought to understand the importance of your concepts. You can shape 
your concepts from different things. Preachers will tell you this. I bought some church pews one time for our church. I was talking to the man out there who was selling them. He said, I represent our church on this. He said, I'm on the church board. I said, are you a deacon? He said, no. He said, I'm just an attorney. I said, you're on your church board? He said, yes. I said, do you believe what your church preaches? He said, not necessarily. I don't know if I believe the Bible or not. I said, what are you on their church board for? He said, well, because they said I was so smart, I was so intelligent that I would be good to help guide this church. You know, you know this thing ain't operated by brains. We don't operate by brains. I'm, I'm surrounded with people with so many degrees around here. I'm, I'm intimidated by it. I don't, when you pick up the back of my book, it don't have any, de, uh, any, uh, any type of degrees. My degree has come from DDP. Difficult and dumb people. They have educated me immensely. Amen. And it means so much. Let me tell you something. Paying tithe is a concept. It's not about money. It's about faith. You don't pay tithe because you have money. You pay tithe because you have faith. See, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out upon you a blessing, you'll not be able to receive. That's what it is. It's not about money. It's about your faith in God. If I give God 10%, can he bless me? Yes, he can. Abundantly. He can give you jobs you're not even qualified. What you do, he can bless your clothes. He can bless your home. He can take care of everything you got. When you give to God, he said, I will rebuke the devourer. Whatever's eating away your monies, I will put a stop on him. I will stop him. I will put a hindrance to what devours your money. So it's your concept. If you've lost your concept of that, you're not going to pay tithe. I know sometimes people say, well, I sent mine here and I sent mine there. You can't send your tithe anywhere. It's not yours. You bring it to the house of God, your storehouse. It's not your money. The tithe belongs to the Lord. So it goes to where it belongs. Praise God. Everybody say amen. Amen. And your concept about church. I go to church because I know what happens to me when I go. The Bible said about David. Did you not read what David did when he had a need? When David saw the prosperity of the wicked, he was confused, stumbling around. He said, I was so misled, I was so confused, and I arose, and I went to the house of God, and I saw their ladder in. When I got there, God took the blur away, and I knew what I should do. I should be in the house of God. When you're away from God's house, you can get yourself so confused in life. All day long on your job, somebody's going to tell you where your answer is. You know your answer is always at the house of God. And when David was hungry... The Bible said he went to the house of God. And Ahimelech the priest said, have your soldiers kept themselves from women? He said, they have this night. He said, here's bread. Here is shoe bread, holy bread, uncommon bread. Take and eat this. He knew where to go when he was hungry. You know where you go when you're hungry? You go to the house of God. You don't stay home and watch a TV program, put your hand on the TV, and grab a hold of the antennas if they got them, whatever they got nowadays. I'm a little outdated, ain't I? That's why y'all making fun of me. You know better, don't you? Huh? Who said, oh boy, amen, I'm in a dangerous spot. I've been here before. But the whole thing is simply this. You cannot, nothing works like walking into the house of God. I need to get to the house of God. I need to be there. When this camp meeting is over, I'm going to go back home and Sunday morning, I'm going to go to church with a whole different attitude. I'm going to be changed. I'm going to be walking in there. When my preacher preaches, I'm going to make a camp meeting preacher out of him. When my choir sings, they're going to be a camp meeting choir singing. They're going to see me shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord. They're going to see me pour my soul into it. Praise God. And so when David needed a weapon, the Bible said he went to the house of God. And Ahimelech, he said, the king's business required haste. And he said, I need a weapon. I have no weapon. He said, I've got something for you here. The sword of Goliath, whom you slew in the valley of Elah. This is his sword. He said, it's right here. It was head behind the ephod. The ephod is a holy garment the priests wear. This is miraculously good. Everybody say amen. Amen. And he wrought that sword out, pulled that ephod away from it. It had been wrapped in a holy garment. What a man of God teaches you and preaches you from this book is coming from holy things. It's a holy thing. It has been hidden among holy things, holy people, holy prayer. Praise God. Your concept should be this. Church is everything. 
My pastor is important. The preacher is important. Everything is so important to me about worship, prayer, and spiritual things. I need to have fresh concepts built on the principles of God's word. It happens. I need this. Concepts will propel you. They will propel you, sir, away from the church or deeper in the church. Your concepts will propel you to love a preacher or distance yourself from the ministry. Your concepts will propel you to love your wife and kids more than you ever imagined you could love them. Your concepts will propel you to worship God in ways you didn't think you could. You'll catch yourself coming to prayer services, being on time for church, finding time in the altar to pray with someone, teach a Bible study. Our concepts, we live them out no matter what they are, if they're good or bad. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad. And if your concept is anti-church, anti-preacher, anti-worship, you know what you're going to do? Not worship. You'll always have a reason not to come to church. Every family reunion, you'll have, you'll have four a month. Anything. That's not your concepts. You, you will live your concepts, whatever they are. If they lack reality, if they lack truth, it doesn't matter. That's why Joshua said, if you think it be evil to serve the Lord, serve your gods. If, it's not evil to serve the Lord, but if you think it is, you're not going to serve the Lord. If you think the worst thing in the world is to sit down and write a check for tithe, you're not going to do it. It's not the worst thing. Nobody depletes their resources when they give to God. Somebody says, you give all your money to the church, you end up in the poorhouse. In my city, everybody that lives in the poorhouse part of my city, none of them go to our church. They didn't give themselves there from our church. Something else went wrong in their ideas. Amen. It's my concepts of one God, Jesus' name. My concepts, my concepts, I will live out my concepts. They will propel me to great visits and blessings of God or they will propel me away from everything that's good. I will end up in the wrong place at the wrong time in my life. This is not a time to cut yourself short in God. Thank God for this church. Thank God for all these great apostolic churches in this district. Thank God for all these great preachers. Well, tell your preacher this week before you get away, I appreciate your preaching the truth to me. I appreciate your care. Tell the preacher's wife, I appreciate you standing with your husband. In all of our hardships, when we lose people, you still stand there and you walk up and when people walk out, you stand right up in the pulpit and still preach and worship. You still lead us no matter what everybody else does. Does. I appreciate that for you. Come on, let's develop the right concepts where we can be right always in God. Let's stand to our feet, clap our hands, and shout yes to the Lord. Yeah. Worship God right now. Yes. Oh, mighty God, mighty God. right your concepts will shape you you will live them out you will live out your concept there are seasons in all of our lives where we have to have constant renewing this one thing I do that's why Joshua said us to me in my house we will serve the Lord we're going to do this Israel said, God forbid that we would ever depart from him. And they did. Lost everything. The walls, the temple, and the sacred things. And it happens. When you lose your concepts, they propel you into areas you don't want to be. You don't want to be that way. You don't want to be in God's alternative. I want to be in God's intention of my life. If God intends for me to be blessed tonight, if God intends for my church to have revival, I want to experience that revival. If God intends to give me a thousand people, I'm not going to let some quirky ideology mess me up. I'm not going to miss that. I'm not going to let something goof me up. If God intends to heal my wife of cancer I'm not going to get goofed up in my mind about that I'm going to have this mealy healing God whatever is available for this district right now let's raise our hands God whatever you've got in the future of this district touch it touch this district every preacher every preacher's wife we want it to happen in Jesus name whatever you've got for this district God we want it to happen in Jesus I can't hear you. you got to pray a little better than that, please. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, I pray for this district. They've come a long ways. 
great preachers, great saints, great music, great worship, great preachers, great facilities. You bless this district abundantly. God, you have smiled on this district. You have found great things about this district you like and you love. I ask you, God, right now, open up their future. Whatever's in the way, remove it right now. Let everybody's concept be, I want whatever God's God intended for me. Whatever revival in my city, I want it to happen. Whatever miracle for my family, I want it to happen. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's lift our hands and let's worship God. Let's worship God tonight.